if I have doubts, sort of not doubting, like, oh, I'm just going to turn that off. That's not what the scriptures are talking about. I'm here with Andrew Del Rio, who's a philosopher, a theologian, is the director of the Apologetics Initiative here at George Fox University, which is the best private university in Oregon, according to the Wall Street Journal, which means you have the best apologetics initiative in Oregon. Fair point. How do you feel about that? I feel good. <laughs> I think it's right. I heard you have a forthcoming academic paper called Irrational Inquiry. That sounds so complicated. What is it about? <laughs> yeah, it is a little bit complicated, I guess. It's about uh, whether epistemic norms are zetetic norms. That is so repellent. No, it's great. It's I can, amazing. I, I can't even think about that. I don't even know what those words mean. Well, that, that's, that's, okay. that's why that's, that's this is why you're a philosopher. This is why you're a theologian. <laughs> How did you ever, when did apologetics become a live issue in your life for the first time? Yes. Yeah, so I was in high school and I think maybe this is when it becomes a live issue for many, at least in the form of having doubts yeah. about faith. If you've been totally. raised in a kind of religious household. Um, so for me, I was raised in a religious household and kind of accepted what my parents were telling me. And then when I got into high school, I started like forming new questions that I had never thought of before. Like, where did the Bible come from? Right. How do we know this stuff? Why do we trust it? Um, and so at that stage, my parents started talking to me about this and I, I got introduced to the world yeah. of apologetics. Yeah. Um, and then I kind of have followed a road of kind of digging deeper yeah. uh, for many years. Having gone through that experience, and I know you have kids of your own too who are getting to that age, what advice would you give to parents whose kids are getting to that age and they are starting to question things or, or think things even that you don't want them to think? And like, how, how do you approach it with someone that age? What's, what's your experience? I say lean into helping them ask their questions. That's the first thing. Um, I have a friend who did a study on children that are raised in religious backgrounds mm. and then apostatize, they lose their faith I as see. they grow up. I see. And one of the main things was that they were discouraged from asking their questions. Oh, really? Um, and so, yeah, helping your kids form and articulate and wrestle with their questions is actually super important, I think, for uh, maturing in faith. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and yeah, there are great resources out there, um, but... The main thing I would say is just to like not discourage yeah. the, the questioning. You know what's wild about that for me is like, I hear that as a parent, I'm a parent, I have a high school child and I think to myself, oh yeah, that's clearly the right advice, right? Clearly. And I would say that to anybody too, but actually what, what I find in harder parenting moments, I almost also at the same time have this avoidance reflex where it's almost like, I just want to have this attitude, like don't ask, don't tell, like don't talk about your, don't talk about problems and maybe they won't exist. I feel the exact same thing. I mean, even though I know this, right, when my my, chil my child, who I have two teenagers now, mm. um, when they're like wrestling with something, I'm like, well, here, here's the answer. Just like, <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah. you know, just go with it. Go with the flow and don't. Yeah. But it's, it's counterintuitive, but that's actually harmful, right? And um, it's because we want the faith to not just be something that they know the right answer to, right. but they have to make that answer their own. Oh. And that happens only through this process, I think, of wrestling many times at least and doubting and thinking very wow. deeply um, about the issues. This hits me so hard because I was just thinking this thought with relation to my teenage daughter the other day. Like there are failures. There are things that she's going to have to fail at in life and in faith. And I'm going to have to watch that failure. And I, there's no other path for her. There is the, the only path is through that failure and through her making that meaning. And from a faith perspective, through God actually speaking to her and making that real because right. she can't actually just draft off the fumes of like what I want. It's scary. That is, that is actually hard. It's very, it's very scary, I think, as a parent. And you want to be in control. Yeah. <laughs> and like you are in control from such, like from the very beginning, it's like I'm in right. control, I'm in control, I'm in control. And now you're growing up into becoming an adult and forming your faith, right? It's not right. my faith. It has to be your faith. And so right. there's a release of control there, which is scary, but I think which actually serves your child's yeah. faith in the long run. There's a book um, um, by um, the sociologist Christian Smith um, at Notre Dame and mm -hmm. Amy Adamczyk is his co-author. Um, I forget what it's called. We'll link it down in the comments below, but it's, it's about basically how would you raise kids in a faith tradition so that they continued in the faith tradition. 
And the number one thing that they found across all categories, all religions, it was multi-religious too. It was mm -hmm. Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. I think they even did some Hindu as well. They found that repeated small conversations were the best way to inculcate faith. And I think sometimes I gear up like as a parent for the big mm -hmm. swing, like mm -hmm. it'll be this huge emotional moment where it'll be like, we're taking a walk, the sun is setting, the wind blows the leaves. And I'm like, I go on a 45 minute thing. Monologue. And, a monologue. <laughs> <laughs> and really it's only, it's about these small, but repeated, not just small once a year, but like small, like every day kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, praying together or reading together or bringing up. And I actually have also found that I feel like a failure as a parent on that front too, because it's just, it's hard to make that a rhythm if that wasn't modeled for me in my life, which it wasn't. My parents were great parents, but like, it just wasn't like an everyday kind of part of our life like that. Mm. And so it's hard to try to create something out of nowhere, a habit mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I mean, it makes me think about my own childhood and I'm, I'm, rec I'm realizing as you say that I do think actually uh, my parents modeled that pretty well mm. of these small, just kind of continuing conversations, um, where I had doubts and we talked about it and we also talked about the sermon on Sunday afterwards yeah. and kind of like, let's, yeah. what, was that a good sermon and why, why not? <laughs> and like, um, and just a million other ways of just talking about faith and it was just sort of, and so I'm really grateful, mm. um, for that, I think maybe, you know, that's in large part why I didn't lose my faith when I went through a season of doubt and in college, wow. it kind of amped up um, as I took philosophy of religion classes from what I thought were like heroes. And then they turned out to be anti-heroes and I was very confused about what to think. And <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, so grateful for, yeah. for my parents and hope, hope to figure out how to do it myself. Is, is doubt the opposite of faith? Do you think, or something else? It's a it's a great question. I think faith and doubt are consistent. They can go together hand in hand. Um, I think it's a a popular notion that doubt is opposed to faith, mm -hmm. um, but actually, this is something Dostoevsky wrote in a journal once. Uh, he said, "My um, my Hosanna." comes from a furnace of doubt. Oh. And there's an idea there, I think, that actually faith is served <laughs> by our doubts. Um, it's formed with our doubts. And so there's a deepening of faith that happens through the doubting. Mm. Um, and, th and this is exactly why I think it relates to this idea about raising our children, right? Because we can't just squash their doubts. If we do, we'll squash the furnace <laughs> that is building their Hosanna. Um, and so doubt is not necessarily an ideal. It's not like we're, we're like, oh, I want to become more doubtful. <laughs> yeah, um, I want to be the champion doubter. No, no, not at all. But faith is, it grows through doubt. And, and, and doubt is a, a sign of an a mind awake, like an intellectually active hmm. mind, mm -hmm. um, which is good. God gave us minds. He wants us to use them. It's also the sign, I think, of a kind of humility about my own abilities and capacity wow. to understand um, yeah. my, finitude, my finitude. So doubt is very natural and it's very normal, I think, in the development of faith. Um, mm. We don't want to stigmatize it. At the same time, we want to grow, I think, to a place where we have less doubt. That's great. That's, uh, I think, a sign of a deepening and robust faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So not in conflict, not, not an opposite. Yeah. That's really, that's really life affirming from my own experience. I think I would be lost without an answer like that mm. in my life. I do notice though, that doubt is stigmatized a lot mm -hmm. as, as sin or with fear. Yeah. Why is yeah. that? Why is that? If it's, if it's, if it's so clear in the way that you're putting it, I love these words like mm -hmm. that. It's, it's, it's part of the faith journey. Why is it stigmatized as as sin so often? I don't know. Maybe is the f the first thing to say, um, but I have suspicions that it is stigmatized for some of the same reasons that you and I feel we want to just tell our kids, like, don't worry about it. Just this, here's the right answer, right? Fear, anxiety. Yeah, fear, anxiety, like a, a sense of losing control. Mm. Um, I I often wonder, did Jesus have doubts? Mm. It says that he grew in wisdom and knowledge, which is 
Interesting. And so it's like, well, what does that look like? Are there doubts? Some people might say that Jesus has doubts in, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Right. Or, or even on the cross. My God, my um, God, why have you forsaken me? Exactly. So, you know, there's different ways of interpreting that passage and, and the psalm that it's referring to. But um, it seems to me if we, if we pay attention <laughs> to the, the narrative of Scripture, um, from the lament <laughs> to, you know, these, these moments of Hosanna, like, Doubt is just part of that process, and and so it it's it's dangerous, I think, to categorize it as a sin. Um, at the same time, doubt is discouraged in the scriptures. Um, mm. There are times where it says, "Like, do not, do not doubt, do not doubt, believe, believe." Yeah. Um, but the reality is, if I have doubts, sort of not doubting, like, oh, I'm just going to turn that off. Right. That doesn't, that's not what the scriptures are talking about. Mm. <laughs> Rather, they're talking about coming to a place of confidence. Mm. And so when, when the man who's asking Jesus to heal his son in Mark 9, I think it is, he says, you know, heal my son. And then Jesus says, well, do you think it's possible? He's like, I think so, but I believe, but help my unbelief, the yeah. man says. Yeah. He's asking Jesus to help his, help him with his doubts and Jesus isn't just like, well, just turn those doubts off. Rather, Jesus shows him. Mm. He gives him evidence, I think, for the thing that the man is worrying about. Mm -hmm. Can you do this, Jesus? Mm -hmm. Yes, I can. He heals the man. And not only does he answer the man's prayer that his son would be healed, but he answers the man's request to help his unbelief. Right. And so... We don't, we're not, we're not called to just turn off our doubts when the scriptures are telling us to do not doubt. Rather, it's to grow towards a place where we have a kind of confidence in, in these truths of scripture and the things that we're, we're taught um, that is, I think, reasonable and a rational kind of position. Yeah. It also reminds me of the stories of Thomas, famously called Doubting Thomas. Even in songs that discourage, don't be a doubting Thomas. I think that's part of a <laughs> song I remember from my childhood. But like Thomas, I think in the Gospel of John, right? He, Thomas's doubts asking Jesus like, well, who are you then? Yeah. Actually, or asking to, to feel the wound spot. They actually prompt Jesus to make the highest levels of revelation that he then makes. I mean, makes the most explicit disclosure of his identity in response to Thomas in the first instance. And in the mm -hmm. second, um, basically showing them his res resurrected body in a different way. Yeah. And he's not actually condemned, but the way that that even makes its way into our popular culture of faith and our language I think stigmatizes. So there's an important point here for, for parenting and for just life. Um, which, Jesus doesn't stigmatize Thomas, right? He, and it's a sort of warm embrace mm -hmm. that I think he gives Thomas. He also says something after that about blessed are those who believe and do not see. Right. And I think that's a crucial bit of what faith is about because in the scriptures, faith is not opposed to reason or to knowledge as it is opposed to sight. Mm. faith and sight. And so th those ideas are connected here in the story about Thomas. Um, I have this painting in my office and I refer to it. I point at it many times with my students because it's a, it's a painting of Thomas uh, reaching into the side of Jesus, this famous Caravaggio. Oh yeah. That's a great painting. Because so many times the students come into my office and they're, they're wrestling with something and they're like, well, should I, is it even wrong for me to be like asking these questions? Mm -hmm. um, should I, is it wrong for me to be looking for reasons for these things? And mm -hmm. I say, no, 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 Jesus, look what Jesus did to Thomas. He gave him reasons. Yeah. So we can't think it's wrong mm -hmm. um, to give reasons. I think it's, mm. it's all part of growing in this faith and the growth of development of maturity. When you work as a Christian scholar and you give, you work as an apologist, you work to give reasons for faith and, and, and a rational complex within and around faith. Is there, people sometimes talk about a, a leap of faith, mm -hmm. right? Like the idea that maybe there's some point at which rationality and math and science and some of that stuff from your, your paper you mentioned earlier, it can take you to a certain place, but there's actually a gap and you have to leap. Do you believe that that's true or is, is, is it all, is it all rational all the way, all the way there? Ah, yes. The leap of faith, the leap into the darkness. Kierkegaard's famous language, right? Kierkegaard. The leap. He talks about a leap that you take. Uh, some people are going to be disappointed when they hear this, but I think Kierkegaard is off track here. Oh. Um, great, great thinker, great philosopher, great writer. 
So no, my answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> no, you there's no leap. There's no leap. Um, there's no leap. Yeah, I mean, maybe it depends on what we mean by a leap. Um, sure. But what? What do you? What's your sense of the leap? Are you? Are you yeah. like really drawn to this leap idea? I am drawn to it. I Tell am drawn more. to it. It could be, you know, I, I can't match wits with you as a philosopher or a theologian, but I can say that in my own experience. I think there's a point at which I love rationality and I love the path that takes me there. But it could even be that I've had some bad experiences with apologetics in a mm. sense. Maybe you could, maybe I could, you could be my confessor, or help heal me of that experience. But the experience being that this kind of like scaffolding of rationality that it can lead in wrong directions even, or it can fall apart, or there are contested rationalities, or, you know, you're a super smart person who uses rationality, but there are other equal and opposite people who use it too. And it seems to just fight to a sort of impasse to the point at which I think many believers would just be like, gosh, I do run to a point of doubt. And then it's like, what do you do? You ultimately have to, we're all believing in something, you mm -hmm. know, like it's fair to say that we're all believers <laughs> in, in, in a way you have to believe to live, yeah. right? And so at that point where just our brains can't take us any further, the leap feels like a natural image of faith. So that's mm -hmm. maybe the best defense I could even give of it, just to say it's a natural experience for people to go through that. I think what you're saying about the leap, the way you're describing it, is something that I would I would agree with, mm -hmm. right? What, I think what you're saying here is, and this goes back to the notion of faith being opposed to sight. Yeah, um, There is a point at which in many things, not just in religion, actually in all domains, <laughs> mm -hmm. we don't have certainty. Mm -hmm. So, but we have to make a choice of how we're going to live. Mm -hmm. And that's where I would say, yes. And, and of course, in that sense, I'm not um, saying you can be certain about everything that the Bible is teaching or that your religion has taught to you, the traditions and the theology and the doctrine. No, you, you, you are not certain, but I do think it's not opposed to reason. Um, and so for many things, all kinds of forms of faith, of trust, of individuals, of how sturdy this chair is, <laughs> I am not 100% certain. Are you saying that certainty is equated to sight? Sight and certainty are the same thing? They're not. No, no, you can be uncertain in sight too. But there is um, a certain kind of certainty that comes from sight. I can be, here's what I can be certain of with my sight. I can be certain that I'm being appeared to or having a sensation as if there's a water bottle here. Yeah. Um, that maybe I can be certain of, and that's, and that's based in sight. But what I can't be certain of, however, is that there is a water bottle here. <laughs> and this is where I think doing some philosophy really helps because you start to realize, oh, there's much less things that I'm certain about than I initially would have thought. For example, that the past <laughs> exists. Right. Past like five minutes ago when all of the world popped into existence with all of our memories. Like, right. can you be certain of that? Or right. that there's an external world, like that there is a water right. bottle, that I'm not in the matrix. That, right. there, that all of these skeptical right. scenarios, how do we... I heard, I heard a wild... Do we take a leap? I heard a wild theory the other day that there's, there are some people, even a couple, maybe a serious historian who thinks that maybe during the medieval period, medieval clerics and people invented the entire medieval period and an entire past for Christianity, you know, during that, during that time in, in Christian Europe. So like that, that radical skepticism could go really deep. Radical skepticism is radical. <laughs> it is, <laughs> it is huge. Yeah. And, and so we have to ask, because oh, are we taking a leap? Well, we're not certain about these things, but Nevertheless, I would claim at least that we are still reasonable. Mm. We are still rational in t informing the opinions that we do. Um, if you're a radical skeptic, maybe you will have to, you will deny that. Mm. But most, and epistemology is the branch of philosophy that I, I work in mostly, which is about rationality of belief. Mm -hmm. Most epistemologists deny that kind of radical skepticism. They think, no, 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 we have a ton of reasonable beliefs about all kinds of matters in, in this life and in the world even though we lack certainty. And so if that's what we mean by a leap, mm -hmm. um, yes, then I'm on board. What do you if, think? What if do... rather we mean, no, you have to become irrational yeah. <laughs> in order to have faith. I don't see the need for that. Is that what you think Kierkegaard meant, that you had to become irrational? Kierkegaard's hard to understand. <laughs> <laughs> but you're drawing a distinction between different kinds of leaps. Yeah. I Speaking of leaps, walk me through this leap. 
I, I have, I have, I have sometimes found apologetics to be not compelling and I've sometimes found it to be really compelling when I read someone like CS Lewis and the basics in like abolition of man or, or mere Christianity, when he does this thing, like he takes us into a basic morality, like, Hey, the world can't even exist. Like there's no society that can exist whose basis is lies and rape and murder. Mm -hmm. It can't be that. In other words, there's a shared common morality and he begins to reason us into a kind of thinking about maybe even God. I feel like I can follow that. And there's something just inside of me intuitively. You could even say mystically, even if you didn't share my religious convictions that I just kind of feel like, ah, you like look at the stars, you look at the world. It just feels like, man, there's something weird out there. There's something even weirder than maybe we can even articulate through our faith. And I mm -hmm. think most Christians probably do agree on that at least. Mm -hmm. To get to that point though, that recognition of the weird, that there's something going on here, that feels intuitive. That feels like I can get there. Even if I'm not there and I'm like, ah, there's no God. It makes no sense. Someone could reason me there and I could be like, okay. Mm -hmm. To go from that though to the ultra specifics of Christian faith feels like another, an, an entirely different search. Something that's much harder to prove down in the weeds. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that's true? Or do you think that the search after that basic recognition of God is essentially the same kind of search just further? Or neither of those two things. <laughs> yeah. Ah, that's hard. That's a hard question. Because when I, you get into Jesus, now you have to get into like, suddenly you're becoming like a biblical scholar and you're talking about Greek language and you're right, talking about evidence right. for the resurrection. And it's like, whoa, right. that's that's so serious. That's so detailed. Yeah. And maybe people feel like they're taking a leap at that point. It It is it is empirical. I think both of those, th I'm trying to figure out like, well, what's the difference, right? Mm -hmm. Um and both of them, both of those searches seem to rest on some observations of, of kinds. And so maybe that's that's not the difference. Um, there is a difference, I think, in terms of generalities versus specificities, right? Like how, how historical are we getting? Mm -hmm. Like historical knowledge is maybe a really crucial difference here. When I'm getting into the, the granularities of Christianity, like yeah. I'm saying some things about history now. Right. I wasn't really saying anything about history in that first sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a whole nother discipline. And so, yeah, I do think there is a difference in mm -hmm. it. But but is it like fundamentally different in terms of like my my reasoning, <laughs> my drawing inferences using induction and deduction and like the kind of thing that I have to do in order to gain knowledge? I don't know if there's a fundamental difference at that level. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess maybe I'm inclined to say, no, it's kind of further up and further in. Um but there's something also continuous. It's not completely discontinuous what's going on there mm -hmm. um, as we seek to understand, well, why should I think Christianity is the case mm -hmm. rather than just there's some great mystery in this in this universe. And that, does, that should also, we should emphasize the, the, the thought about that great mystery is really valuable and important mm. um, because so many people, I think, walk through their life <laughs> just kind of embracing maybe it's naturalism or some kind of worldview, right? Where they just think, you know, we've basically got it figured out and there's some stuff we don't know, but like give it time, science will figure it out. Mm -hmm. And 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 what Lewis is doing and others have, there's like, well, hold on. There are like these deep, deep mysteries and it doesn't actually look like we're making progress <laughs> on those. Um, I think that actually sets us up quite well for understanding the value of religion mm. um, and should make us then seek like, well, is Christianity, is there reason for thinking Jesus rose from the dead? Um, what did Jesus teach? Like, maybe I should look into that. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's a really important starting point and I do agree that it's easier to get to it. Um, but I think there's more value and, and more to, more to be had. Yeah. One of the critiques of apologetics I think I see and hear the most is something like this. Apologetics pretends like it's for outsiders, convincing the heathens out there, the atheists that they should believe, but actually mm. it's just like a pep rally for insiders mm. to feel better about themselves and their beliefs. Do you think that there's, is that true? Is there something true, true about that? I mean, really it's just a pep rally. Uh, I don't, I don't think it's a pep rally, but is it for believers? Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, this is what we were talking about when we started is like believers will have naturally, rightfully, will have doubts mm -hmm. if their minds are awake. <laughs> right. And what should they do with those? Um, I think 
they should inquire. <laughs> and apologetics is um, what they're inquiring into. And so I think that's it's right to say that apologetics is for believers. I think it's also right to say that it's not just for believers. And this is what how it started in history. Like mm. Peter talks about giving a defense for your faith to those who ask you about it. <laughs> and then, you know, there are different origin, Justin Martyr, these different Tertullian, they start explaining to their neighbors who are criticizing their faiths, like, well, here's why we believe this, and let me defend this. Um, that's also appropriate and part of of the deal, and I think it's useful in ministry. I I, I have found this, like, when, with, when talking to friends who come from a very different tradition or no faith tradition, we naturally talk about these things. Mm. Um, and... Some of them have become Christians. Um, and so I think it plays a role. It's played a role in my own faith for sure. But there are others like C.S. Lewis famously who he was kind of first kind of brought to Christianity, I think, through some intellectual means. And Antony Flew is another famous uh, atheist who was a very like leading atheist philosopher in the 20th century who now changed at the end of his life um, he's no longer with us, but changed his view and now believes there is a God and um, and wrote about that at the end of his life because of some arguments that he's like, yeah, these actually make sense. So mm. there's a value there, I think, for both the outsider and, and the insider. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, I do think, and you mentioned this earlier, there's some like suspicion of apologetics or like a bad a bad vibe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a bad aura around it. Yeah. Like it's somehow like maybe like a slick salesman kind of tactic. Like, hey, if I can just trick you into kind of admitting that these three things are true, you know what the conclusion has to be. Right. You know, that kind of thing. I've yeah. seen things like that on YouTube even, you know, like street evangelists going out and kind of tricking people. You're sighing. You've, right. you've seen those kind of things. That's not your, well, not your way. It's because I, I value apologetics. I value for it how it's helped me in ministry, for how it's helped me personally in my own faith. Mm. But I also see the stigma and I don't want there to be that stigma. I mean, but I understand it because it it has been abused or it has been used in ways that are not that helpful or sensitive. Mm. Like anything, mm. <laughs> I think um, you need to have a relationship with a person, which is honestly why this whole kind of context is a little bit strange for me. I'd, I'd much rather be like sitting down over coffee yeah. and not like publicizing to the world uh, because I want to have a relationship with you and apologetics works best when it's done in that kind of context where mm. I'm being sensitive to your personal needs and your feelings. And, and this is what Peter said. He said, with gentleness, think about that, being gentle. It's a thing that you need to know another person in order to know what what is going to be perceived as gentle and respect, right? Um, this is how he sort of describes how you should give a defense for the hope mm. that is in you. So it's hard to be gentle and respectful when it's through uh, some yeah. social media right. medium, right? Um, right? But maybe the goal in those cases, to the earlier point about what is apologetics for, maybe the goal is not to be respectful. Maybe the goal isn't even to win someone for Christ. Maybe the goal in those kind of settings that you've called abuse mm. is actually some other kind of self-serving goal. Cause we could do yeah. that. We could win an I, argument. I, Look I, how I, smart I am. I could totally do that in my life. I could miss the, I could miss the main picture and pursue some totally selfish goal instead. Mm -hmm. I wonder as we close here, if, if I could present you with a, a hard scenario that's, that's been a part of my life, you know, I, to the extent that I'm still able to get in the classroom and be a professor, I have students who come to me, you mentioned this earlier and students, you know, these teenagers, young people today, people in their twenties, wow, what a hard era that they're living in. I sometimes wonder whether God will have some kind of special mercy or grace for the kind of world we live in, just saturated with ideas and thought and people leaving church and just despair. And it's so, so tough. And I guess, yeah, it, I, I feel the despair when someone sits down and says like, hey, I'm thinking about leaving faith. Or I've actually, I haven't told my parents yet. I haven't told anybody, but I've actually left faith completely. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I know in this short time that we have left here, there's no way to sketch out a, you know, 10 point answer for how someone gets back on track or, th or thinks about faith in a way that, that as a professor you want them to, but I don't know, what do you tell people like this who are deep in the despair, who are losing it? And they're just like, I'm losing it. I don't have it. Mm -hmm. Where did it go? Yeah. The first thing I, I want that person to hear from me is that, 
I love them. I care about them. And I believe God loves them too. <laughs> um, and that's, that's the first and last thing I want them to hear. Mm. Um, and some, and it, you know, it's not clear from the case exactly. Like, is this a person who sometimes they are like, I'm, I'm, I no longer believe this, but I wish it was true. Right. There are other people who are like, I no longer believe this and I hate it. <laughs> and, and so there are different things totally. to say to those two people. Totally. Um, but yeah, this, th- that starting and ending point, I think the bookends of a conversation with that person, either of them would be that I love you and I think God loves you too. Um, and then it gets into the the weeds of like, well, this is why I think we need the, to be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives as we're talking to another person. Like, what is good for this person? And what I'm doing is praying <laughs> as I'm listening and as I'm talking to that person, like, God, guide me in what I have to say to this person, knowing that some things I say could be viewed as harmful and abusive or, you know, not helpful, yeah. um, whereas other things would be. But I think if it's that student who's coming into my office and, like, I'm really wrestling with these doubts, I, I hope this is true, but I don't really think it is anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I start where we started saying, you know what, doubt is doubt is normal. Mm. Doubt is natural, and that's actually a good sign in your life. It's a sign and an opportunity for you. Um, faith is shallow without doubt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's that's kind of where I would say I would begin. It affirms for them what they're going through, mm-hmm. which is not a sinful thing. At the same time, I would say, um, I wouldn't say this to them, but as I'm thinking through doubt, like sometimes it is a consequence of sin. Like. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. You know what? I just don't read the Bible anymore. And now I have doubts. Okay. Well, maybe you should read the Bible, right? And maybe that will help build your faith. Or maybe the doubts are the result of some sort of choice of of lifestyle that I'm now embracing that I really think is my way of ignoring what I've been taught is true, True. right? Doubt can come in those ways. C.S. Lewis had this really helpful thing to say about doubt. Maybe we should end with this. But he said that um, doubts, um, the source of doubt is many times not a reason for doubt. And so interrogating the doubt a little bit, like, well, where did this doubt come from? What in your life was the thing that produced the doubt? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the source of the doubt wasn't actually a good reason for doubt. And once you see that this thing here was the source, <laughs> you the doubt kind of shrivels up a little bit. It loses some of its oomph. Um, and there's just wisdom, I think, in doubting our doubts. That mm-hmm. is to say, like, well, why am I thinking this? Usually, I think the most general case is doubt arises from an unmet expectation of some kind. And so like, well, why did I have that expectation thinking through that? And was it actually unmet? Might it still be met yet (laughs) Um, in the future? And so thinking through some of those questions with the student um, in this context of them knowing that I'm for them and I'm on their side, I think is how I want to. Yeah. How I want to approach it. Well, and as a professor, when you enter a classroom in a Christian setting, you do, as you've pointed out implicitly, at least take a a certain kind of a risk, but it's a risk that you entrust to God ultimately, not Mm -hmm. alone. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Del Rio, for sharing this with us today. It's been great to be here. Thanks. Thank you so much.